Howdy, folks. Welcome to Redneck Gone Green. I'm your host, David Cobb. I, I am the redneck, and I have gone green, and I'm trying to convince you to do it, too. And a reminder that here on Redneck Gone Green, when we talk about going green, we mean that in a multiple of ways. Uh, the first way, the most important way, really, is deep ecology, not merely environmentalism or conservation, a acknowledgement an understanding of the interconnectedness of all life, that we are in a reciprocal dance with all of creation, and that whatever we do to that web of life, we do to ourselves. And whether you come at that from a hard, scientific, objective, materialist uh, perspective, or you come at it from an eco-feminist uh, spiritual perspective, they are both true. We are interconnected and we are destroying the planet that we depend upon for life itself. The second way that we mean go green is Green Party. I am a proud member of the Green Party. I ran for president on the Green Party ticket. Uh, I managed the Jill Stein Ajamu Baraka presidential campaign. I believe that we must create our own people's party, a party that is independent from the corporatist Democrats and Republicans, that it's going to take all of us working together and not merely in elections, but that we make a mistake if we don't engage elections as well as direct action, as well as building alternatives. We need an overall compelling strategy. That's why I think that this show is going to be a particularly interesting one, because tonight we're going to be joined by both Sherry Honkala and Shamako Noble, both leaders of the Poor People's Army, uh, also known as the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. These are, and I'm going to just say it, they're, yes, they're my friends. Uh, happy and proud to say that. But more importantly, for the purpose of this show, these are get shit done revolutionaries. These are people who do not shy away from naming capitalism as an economic system that's causing poverty. They don't shy away from the, the fact that we need a revolution and an entirely new system. So the uh, And they also engage in elections and I will just lift up that Sherry Honkala ran for vice president on the Green Party ticket with Jill Stein in 2012. And Sherry Honkala ran for sheriff of Pennsylvania. To me, the best campaign slogan for a sheriff I ever heard is no evictions, everybody, no foreclosures, everybody stays in their home. Uh, and I just thought that was some of the most brilliant political uh, framing I've ever heard. And with that, we're going to bring in Sherry Honkala and Shamako Noble. Hey, y'all. Hello. Hey, what up? What up? What up? All right. So, uh, so Sherry Hunkala, you heard how I introduced y'all, right? Uh, I want to give you a chance, though, because I know you well, uh, and I want to give you an opportunity to speak for yourself and actually introduce yourself. Like, who are you? How'd you get here? Like, why do you do what you do, lady? I don't know. No. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, that was strange. <laughs> Uh, my name is, uh, yeah, Sherry Honkala, and uh, uh, I, how did I get here? I'm a formerly homeless mother, and I live in the heart of Kensington, and um, 200 people, 193 people died from overdoses in, in my neighborhood uh, this last year, and uh, I'm just sick and tired of um, watching what's happening to this country and to this world. And so that's what I, why I do what I do. Um, right on. <laughs> so, and I, again, like, cause I, I wanted to actually, cause Sherry is always like, uh, she is not ashamed to acknowledge that she was a former houseless teen mother and that that has shaped her politics uh, and what she does. So, Shamako, I'm going to ask you the same question, like, because I know the, you as a culture worker, uh, as a, a hip hop artist, as a cultural organizer. Uh, but I, I'd love to hear, like, so what shaped you? Why do you do the kind of work that you do? Yeah. Um, it's funny. Uh, I didn't put this in my little um, note sheet before uh, I came on here. Um, 
you know, I, I start I started this work as an artist, um, and um, sort of through that process became an organizer um, in culture and community. Um, and I think that that sort of evolved over time um, into a spiritual process. I would say today um, it's an expression of my faith, um, which, you know, we could talk about more later if you like or not. Um, but, uh, you know, <laughs> some of the things that are happening right now, right? Like uh, the massive layoffs, the like insane um, degrees of economic inequality that continue to widen. It's just, um, yeah. I mean, how can we, how can we just watch these things happen? So thank you, Shimako, uh, for that. Like, And again, like Shimako and Sherry are both friends. Uh, I've been knowing them both a long time. Uh, and, you know, Shimako, I, again, I know you. I, I first met you. You were, uh, you know, you were a hip hop performer and culture worker and organizer, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to me, I, I just want to lift up one of the things that you taught me, right, was that art and culture is not a separate sort of thing, right? Like, Culture is actually everything that we do and how we do it, right? I still remember uh, that through our, our joint work at the U.S. Social Forum. That was really meaningful to me. So I really appreciate you for that. Sherry, I want to circle back with you, though, and, and really get you to do the arc of uh, the Kensington Welfare Rights Union, uh, then uh, evolving into the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, and now the poor people's army, right? Because there's a mm -hmm. there's a trajectory there that I think, and a and a history, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you've been in the trenches a long time in the mm -hmm. uh, in the in the poverty movement. You've seen a lot, and I'd mm -hmm. love for you to like walk us through the foundation and the forming of the Kensington mm -hmm. Welfare Rights Union. Then the 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 the, the thing, the lessons learned from from mm -hmm. that experience. Sure, absolutely. Um, I initially um, helped form this union, uh, which is, um, uh, it was basically a welfare rights focused organization. Uh, I was, a, uh, I was going to say I was, but I also still get some <laughs> public assistance, um, but it was formed by welfare recipients and um, our major concern was uh, how do we survive? Um, we weren't just fighting for bigger and better welfare checks. We were fighting for um, a right to a job uh, at a living wage. And then, um, you know, we, we actually became pretty well known all around the country because we were very active in nonviolent civil disobedience. And then we realized that we as a, small group of welfare recipients couldn't really do anything. Um, and so uh, then we figured we need to go around the country and try to figure out how do we link other groups like ourselves, which meant uh, uh, poor, white, black, brown, uh, all together, and try to learn how to organize um, off of, you know, learn from each other. So we didn't go to traditional like uh, nonprofits necessarily. Uh, if there was a group of people that were organizing in trailer parks, then we organized them or housing projects or what, wherever. Um, and then um, after organizing, um, you know, people like people, whether they were uh, urban or rural, black, white or brown, um, then we came to an understanding uh, over the years that we couldn't just build uh, a multiracial movement to end poverty in this country. We knew that we needed to link up internationally. Um, we needed to globalize from below. And um, uh, after the amounts of... Um, 
you know, just uh, death after death after death, um, no longer winning concessions in terms of housing takeovers and all of those kinds of things. We knew we needed to form some other kind of um, organizational apparatus. And so um, we looked around the world, both in terms of, of traveling and, um, uh, you know, sitting down with different peasant movements from different parts of the world. And we decided to form um, the Poor People's Army. Um, and so um, we know that, you know, like in, uh, you know, um, if a group of um, uh, peasant farmers in Chiapas could, um, you know, come together and decide that they were going to make a fight for themselves. We knew that as uh, poor people in this country who they don't give a damn about, and we know that we're not going to survive here in the belly of the beast under fascism unless we begin something. Uh, and that's why we formed the Poor People's Army. It's not you know, just... Sherry, um, uh rhetoric what are, we've had what are the things that i want to lift <laughs> one of the things that i want to lift up from uh that conversation uh and i want to bring shamako into this as well uh, but that is that the poor people's army and uh people poor people's economic human rights campaign and the kensington welfare rights union mm -hmm. founded by poor people led mm -hmm. by poor people not people mm -hmm. advocating uh, on behalf of poor people poor folks speaking for ourselves making demands for ourselves organizing ourselves and you know again like from the i still remember when i first met you now i don't know 25 uh, years ago that was one of the things that you said at the mic mm -hmm. and at the time people would like and people wouldn't really know this about me unless i say something like like, I know what it's like to carry a five gallon bucket of my family's excrement uh, and mm -hmm. empty it into a, a, a hole in the ground at the end of the day. As a little boy, that's mm -hmm. actually how I grew up. Right. And I used to be mm -hmm. deeply ashamed about that, y'all. I would never fucking talk. I would never talk about it. Right. Mm -hmm. Because this system uh, and, and I'm going to be really honest. There's two things that happen for me. One, therapy. And two, Marxism. Like to actually understand it's the system that's the problem. It wasn't some failure on the part of my mama or daddy or, or, or my mama and my papa. Like at the end of the day, this system was the problem, but they make us, they turn on our, they, they try to get us to turn on ourselves, right? And mm -hmm. to blame ourselves for somehow failing in a system that's mm -hmm. literally designed to make us fail. And that, mm -hmm. I'll be honest, that pisses me off. So Shimako, mm -hmm. I'm going to bring you into this conversation because I, I don't want to out you, right? But I also know like you and the Poor People's Army because <laughs> you're also a poor person, right? Uh, and so how did you get hooked up with Sherry Honkala and them, you know, coming out of your work in hip hop and cultural organizing? So it's, um, one thing I want to put on the table before we um, get into the answer is you know, you made a really important statement, David, which is, you know, it isn't just um, for people, it's led by poor people. And, you know, kind of one of the things that I think we, you know, have the space to talk about today is like, I don't want to, I don't want to downplay the, the reality of like extreme poverty, right? But people who make six figures struggle now. You, you know what I mean? Like today you go to the grocery store and you buy like two tomatoes and um, a can of green beans and it's like $45, <laughs> you know? So um, uh, this is a very uh, challenging time across the board. And again, I'm not down, you know, but I, I think, you know, we're just even talking about like the massive layoffs, right? The, the precariat is at all different sections of the class, but. Anyway, um, Sherry and I met in 2005, I want to say, in, in St. Louis. Uh, she was a keynote speaker for um, Hip Hop Congress. We were having a national conference out there. And um, 
uh, her and I reconnected through a couple of different channels, one of whom was a mutual friend, Lee Ballinger. Uh, you know, we used to have uh, uh, strategy sessions out in, in L.A. Um, during some really interesting times during the, of the development of the hip-hop political movement um, and kind of everything that was going on there. And, of course, you know, um, the, the, the poverty um, uh, movement as well. Uh, eventually became a part of uh, P Perk. Um, have uh, been with Sherry in a couple of, you know, sort of key moments in history. The the 2008 RNC. Um, That's the Republican uh, her, her National Jill's, Convention. Thank you very much. Uh, her and Jill's historical presidential run in in 2012. Um, I remember Sherry had a, a a famous line she used to use all the time. Um, she would say, uh, "You know, I I taught Jill." Uh, about poverty, and Jill taught me how to eat blueberries. And <laughs> she would usually she would usually be eating blueberries when saying this, just to give it that little extra sprinkle of charm or whatever. But um, and then you know, all three of uh, three of us, of course, have worked together on the U.S. Social Forum, um, which was a wild project. I think we should talk about since we have the three of us here. Um, but uh, you know, took a step back from organizing around that time. Um, for a variety of reasons, uh, you know, reconnected. I want to say 2019 or 20. I don't know, one of those two, and I've uh, been doing it ever since. So, you know, Shimako, I want to uh, take you up on that because the U.S. Social Forum it was Mr. Toad's wild ride to be sure. Uh, and for, sure. Uh, for folks who don't know, the, the U.S. Social Forum came I'm out of again. the World Social Forum, which was an mm -hmm. effort. To, and it's really important. It's not just convening mm -hmm. people. It's a movement building process it. in order to say, yes, we convene people in space and time. But the point is, it is building of a movement to build relationships and trust and, and convene each other and share best practices. So the World Social Forum was inspirational. The U.S. Social Forum, y'all, let me just be really clear. In Atlanta, Georgia, 2007, uh, there were over 10,000 of us uh, that gathered. In Detroit, uh, in 2000, uh, uh, like whenever the next one was, we were 13, 14,000 people. By the way, the same uh, time that the Tea Party was able to gather a couple of hundred folks to launch the Tea Party, literally that weekend, Shamako, about what, 15,000 of us were in Detroit, right? Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. of those two things do you think got all the media attention, including from the so-called liberal or progressive media? Yeah, it's true. Right? Definitely so it was true. the Tea yeah. Party that got all the attention, yet we were 15,000 strong, led by uh, black and brown folks uh, and uh, plenty of white folks that were there and engaged, right? But it was multicultural, multi-ethnic, cross-sectoral. There was something really powerful there and it was growing. The, the, the last effort at the social forum, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like bring it real. Here's how, what I think happened. I think all that enthusiasm and excitement, clarity was building. We were integrating political education into it. And when the National Planning Committee of the U.S. Social Forum debated and came to a conscious decision to say that we were going to center political independence, both financial independence and political direction, and that we were going to chart the path on our own, all of a sudden the resources that had been made available began to evaporate. And folks, I'm saying I'm a Green Party member because I know that we need genuine independence. We need to be able to enter the electoral process on our own terms, speaking for ourselves, and we can't let the leadership of the Democratic Party or their funders tell us what to say. So, Shimako, you invited it. So if we're going to talk about the U.S. Social Forum, I'm going to talk about the fact that the foundation world abandoned us because we had the audacity to make political independence front and center. How am I doing? Sherry, why don't you go first? Why don't I go first? Okay, that's the great brother. Um, okay, so it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, 
no funders. Um, the funders of the enemy will never fund me, but that's okay. I'm in good company with many other people um, that have decided to take this road in history, um, which is early on, they kept warning me. All the different foundations, the Ford Foundation, all those folks, and they just said, tone it down, Sherry. Tone it down, <laughs> Sherry. <laughs> yes, they all said, you know, you better not do this. You better not talk about independent politics. Um, you don't need to do these things. Uh, we can put you on the cover of various different publications. We can fly you around the country. You can get a lot of money. Um, all of these kinds of things. And um, I'm so proud of the people that I work with because they refuse to do that. Uh, so they, you know, they pulled the rug out from underneath our feet and uh, just expected that we would crumble. But they did more than just pull the rug out from underneath our feet. Um, they flew in like vultures and stole uh, a great deal of um, our hard work over the years. Um, you know, from our, you know, our music that we wrote um, to our own uh, history. And um, they claimed that they were a part of various different uh, historical things that we had pioneered. And um, many of them were never even in the room. So that was that was actually the hard piece. But then I felt like I had um, a kinship with ancestors in history, um, a lot of, you know, I mean, the people that do the work throughout history, they're never lifted up. They're never in, you know, historical publications. They're not on magazines. And I remember one of the smartest things one of my comrades said to me, they said, you know, um, they're, you know, the ruling class is not going to put um, you guys and your work ever on CNN because <laughs> that's not a part of the plan. Uh, and because, you know, you're not a part of the ruling class's plan, you're never going to be there. Uh, and so that has helped us um, through this process. And, you know, I feel fortunate because we're with a lot of talented people that are documenting our own history. And when I write my, I was going to say book, when I write my encyclopedia, um, because there's going to be a chapter for each one of these bastards, um, you know, I'm just going to write it all. <laughs> Shimako, I want to bring you into this because uh, after my big rant, uh, you insisted, Sherry, you go first. So that must mean you got something to say, too. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I want to just kind of get myself together, I guess. Um yeah, I mean, it probably isn't a, a really significant moment in history to a lot of people in um, what we might call mainstream politics. Um, and I wouldn't even necessarily be mad at them for that, but I mean, we're talking about people who like, like cry when the Democratic Party candidate loses. You know what I mean? Like I'm not I'm not sure <laughs> this is messed up. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to <laughs> I mean because 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 we, we know an emotional attachment like that to either one of the two parties, it's it's almost it's like delusional, right? So you know what, well, Shabako uh, I'm a, a I mean, I mean, I, de depending depending on what your interests are. Let me be clear <laughs> on that. Depending on what on what your interests are, I think for the large majority of the United States, who on any number of issues are struggling with, like, who even cares about me, right? Like, seriously, like, I voted Obama, right? I voted Clinton. Um, I voted Biden. It, God, Biden, man, you know, you see this, like. That guy. I, I don't, I don't want to jump on the guy. It's, it's elder. It's it's elder abuse. Like no, <laughs> seriously. It's el. It's elder. No, I'm not. That's not. It's. I know that there's an edge of humor to it, but seriously, like there's, like it's this is insane, right? Like it's. Am I, is it me or is it actually no, no, insane? It, it is. Looky, I, I want to take like because I think y'all are both making an important point here. And they're gonna I, run him again. 
And they're going to run. Right? I, I mean, they be, I hope they don't. I mean, no. I mean, like, and he's, he's going to lose, team. right? And he's going to yeah. lose, right? Like, so they're going to run him again. He's felon. He's going to lose to a felon. <laughs> he's going to lose to a felon. Like, I mean, damn, this is like this. Like, if you tried to write this up 20 years ago, 10 yeah. years ago as a screenplay, they'd say, man, this is ridiculous. Ain't nobody going to well, believe I mean, this. I, crazy. I, I don't know. I, I, I think I think the Simpsons would disagree with you. But one thing I <laughs> one thing I do, I do want to I do want to make sure we, we, we covered from that point. You know, what we were attempting in that social forum, right, which was basically taking a large scale quote unquote American left event, separating it from its Democratic Party roots and using it to build an independent machine. That's not like a small move. And to do so with like overt communist socialist anarchist roots um you know to have uh, um sort of significant spiritual leadership like like reverend pinkney out in in detroit michigan um you know i i think it would have been foolish on their part not to attack us so that i mean that's deep one of the things that I want to like pick up on, Shamako, you know, when you, you were talking about the like people cry when the uh, uh, Democratic candidates lose and such. And and like this is me like like being real and also trying to summon as much kindness and compassion as I could get, because I remember when Barack Obama uh, ran the first time and there was so many black folks that I that I loved and knew well who were so excited like about the campaign and literally weeping when he got elected. And because I'm a kind person and also because I'm not dumb and I knew that it would be foolish to like get right out in front of that. But I got to tell y'all something, right? Like I can intellectually understand that for some people, they look at Barack Obama, especially when he first ran and said, somebody that looks like me is in the White House. Somebody that looks like me is in the White House. And you know what? I'm a white cracker. I had people who look like me in the White House at like for every year that I've been born and they've been doing nothing but screwing us. So I was not particular, like, like to me, somebody that just happens to look like me, but they're representing the predatory owning class. They still my enemy just because they look like me. So again, I'm not trying to. Uh, David, 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 I, I want, I want to say something and bear with me on this. Right. I think we have to be careful there not to blame the victim. And, you know, what I mean by that is um, I feel like people had a right to be excited about the possibility of what it could mean for somebody who hasn't, who isn't the same thing they've seen for 150 years being in the headship of their country. And I think part of the importance of recognizing that is, you know, I mean, it calls attention to the fact that that was another form of thievery, right? That was a, another form of um, uh, manipulation. Uh, and it's it's only possible because it's real. So, you know, I mean, I'm, I am kind of making an exception in that case, and that might just be the black me. But, I mean, I, did, I, had, I had a lot of relatives who, who felt that, you know? I mean, you know, my, 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 my father was a child when schools desegregated in the South and my mom was a part of the integration of, of Compton that resulted in white flight and had crosses burned in her uncle's yard. And my grandmother was a nurse. She, you know, she was a nurse in the Watts Rebellion. And I call it the Watts Rebellion because I was taught that by my family, right? And like for, for, for the folks who went through this, it was a big deal, you know? And then, Obama and the Democratic Party just stomped all over it. That's on them. The, you know, we, they, they shouldn't get away with that and have the people blamed for it. No, that's look, I, I appreciate the reminder uh, to be kind and compassionate and really understand because people are confused. Right. Uh, and they're confused because a lot of money and resources and uh, media gets used to intentionally confuse folks. Right. Uh, and capitalism does that, but white supremacy does that too. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, 
to with a with a hat tip to Rick James. I, I gotta say, white supremacy is a hell of a drug. Man, I was hoping I'd get a chuckle out of Shamako uh, about that one, but uh, no, uh, at any rate, well, uh, uh, sometimes <laughs> oh, jokes fall. Sorry, flat. sorry. Oh, it was. It was uh, honestly. I, I apologize. It was a wife call. I had to deal with it, so um, I actually missed the joke, and that's oh, why well, he didn't I was get just. I, I, so. I will say it again, just to see. I can chuckle for you anyway. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I don't want a fake one. Don't. Probably I, I don't. Too. I don't want a pity yeah. laugh. But what I said right. was, capitalism intentionally deceives and deludes us all the time just the same way white supremacy does and with a hat tip to rick james white supremacy is a hell of a drug and well, sure, you know just just that that is actually <laughs> white supremacy dave Chappelle mixing it up um yeah. yeah so i actually wanted to ask sherry something kind of in the vein of what we we're talking about if i'm not to be the interviewer but you know i remember looking at the videos <laughs> of her being like in the halls of Congress testifying, right? Um, and and David, you come from um, uh, the Rainbow Coalition. Was there was there a time? Was there a time that you believed? I mean, That's I mean, did you, did you, did, no, you, did, like, you like, did you come into the game being like the Democrats are bad fate? You know what I mean? Or like, is that a process of heartbreaking education? You, you know what I mean? No, that 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 that's a. Uh... Um, that's called loss of innocence. <laughs> that's like, you know, the, the trampling of the heart. That's like so, learning that you invest your many years and your own money and you fill buses over and over again. And you go to Washington DC and you beg progressives, uh, to help mothers not get thrown out of their homes. And you watch promises over and over and over again, and they never get fulfilled. Yes, absolutely. I'm no different than anybody else. I was a hundred percent believer. Uh, and then I realized um, that we had to start changing the focus of our marches to go to March to the Chamber of Commerce, not to Washington, D.C. You know, Shimako, I'm so glad you asked that question, actually, because uh, it does remind me, like, because I can I can channel myself. Uh, and what I'm going to say is, like, again, in that spirit of keeping it real, I remember as a little boy, I was so proud to be an American. I really was, because the the message of liberty and justice and equality, and not just that, that my country, like we would bring liberty, justice, and equality to the rest of the world. And how could you not be proud of that, right? And the seeing is that creation myth, see, it works. It worked on me. It worked on all my classmates because our teachers taught us and they believed it, right? They believed the lie that they were telling because we want to believe it, because human beings want to live in liberty, justice, and equality. And every human being, not just American, but every Nigerian child, every Chinese child, every Cuban child, every God, uh, Palestinian child, every Jewish child deserves to live in liberty, justice, and equality. That creation myth works because we want it to work. But the reality is, like and and so I thought that the system of the Democratic Republic and and voting was the way to do it. So I got involved in it, and I was so I was all in, man. Like I, like yes, we're gonna make a, a, a democracy work. And you know, I still remember working on you know a back end <laughs> in Jerry the Jesse Jackson's campaign was the first presidential campaign that I really threw down on 1984, right? Uh, I was I was all the way in. I, in 1988, I, I I was a delegate for Jesse Jackson, right? I, I came out of the apartheid anti-apartheid movement at the University of Houston as a student activist, uh, you know. And then so Jesse Jackson's campaign was just a natural progression for me, right? And then 1992 was for me at least Jerry Brown. And like, yeah, we the people and, and keep fighting and keep fighting. And then Bill Clinton comes along and Bill Clinton was the one who ripped it for the, 
the, the bandages from my eyes and forced me to confront reality with the Welfare Reform Act and the Defense of Marriage Act and the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. I can go down the list, right? And the thing is, at that time, y'all, I still remember the chair of the Harris County Democratic Party literally saying, Cobb, listen, you're going places. Like, you're smart. You're good looking. That's back when I was young and good looking. You're good looking. People like you. You're charismatic. You're a great speaker. But he said, son, and he put literally put his hands on my shoulders. Son, you got to let go of these issues. And he made the little air quotes, right? Y'all, he didn't mean anger management. Uh, he didn't mean, you know, like, like learning to be compassionate. He literally meant Stop talking about living wage. Stop talking about environmental racism. He meant if I would stop talking about the things that animated me to want to get involved in electoral politics in the first place and actually get along to go, go along to get along, I had a bright future in the Democratic Party. And then you couple that with Bill Clinton and I was like, man, this is a lie. The whole thing is a lie. So for me, Shamako, that was my trajectory. Like I went from being a, a fervent Democrat, to an uneasy Democrat, uh, to a disgruntled Democrat, to a disgusted Democrat, to a former Democrat. And I finally confronted the reality that the Democratic Party is where progressive politics goes to die because all of the energy and enthusiasm and activism that we pour into that is ultimately controlled by the corporate interest, by the neoliberal that they're, they're like the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are basically empty shells that are held together by corporate cash. Sorry, I, I'll get off my soapbox, but it just it pisses me off. I mean, I feel like they lied to me and then they used and abused me and I don't like it one bit. It's great. This is a great transition to talk about the march. Sure. You wanna... <laughs> no, I mean, because I mean, you basically just gave the entire argument. So, Jerry, go ahead, take, take, take tell us about the marches <laughs> on the conventions. That's right. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Shabaka, you did this, right? You took over as interviewer. So, this is me as a guest, y'all. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. No, no, I, mean, I mean, there are no guests or interviewers anymore. We're all just having a conversation. <laughs> anyway, Sherry. What's that? Yeah, and I'm I'm sure you're gonna throw the the March flyer up there, uh, but yeah, it's a different time in history. I mean, I think the that all of us are beginning to wake up if we haven't woke up already, and we know that the Republicans aren't going to do anything for us, and we know the Democrats are not going to do anything for us. So we need as many people as possible to join us. Um, and this is not just any march. Um, we know that, um, you know, our entire planet is at stake. We know we could, you know, all die from war at any given moment. Um, we're tired of the genocide, um, watching, you know, the, the murder of men, women, and children that is happening in Gaza and several other places around the world right now. And we know that with electronics and technology and robotics, that people are being permanently um, replaced and are joining the ranks of the permanently unemployed. And I know at the beginning, I, I talked about, you know, just the massive amounts of deaths. More people have died from the fentanyl crisis uh, than died during Vietnam War. Uh, and so, you know, these are just a few of, of the 2024 realities um, that we're up against right now. And we need to take the world's press and take advantage of it and show solidarity with the rest of the world and um, march on both the Republican and the Democratic uh, National Convention. And we're real excited because um, the city of Chicago messed up and we've got a permit to the front doors of the Democratic Party headquarters of the convention. And we intend to arrest them and charge them with crimes against humanity, both the Republicans and the Democrats. 
So I want to back up a second because I don't like I saw Galen uh, Taylor uh, uh, Tyler, another of the the members of Poor People's Army, uh, put out this post, and it was actually kind of amazing to me. Like, uh, like so, folks, what Sherry is saying is like, like the the people uh, Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign and the Poor People's Army have been marching at the conventions. Uh, you know, both the Republican and Democratic uh, Party national conventions for years, right? Something rather like st- amazing is going to happen, at least in Chicago. And that is they're literally marching on the convention because they literally have a permit that held up in court to be allowed to march all the way up to the very doors, the entrance to the Democratic Party uh, convention. So like, Chamaco, Jerry, did I did I read that right? Is that, that that's how I think I read what Galen put out there? Yes, and that's why it's incredibly important that everybody, their mother, their dog, their cousins, our international guests, you name it, that the whole world join us, um, because um, uh, you know we want to make sure. Uh, that we lift our voices um, and let the world know that these are the kinds of things that we're not gonna settle for anymore, um, that we find both corporate political parties responsible for what's happening and that we need something new and we desperately need it as fast as we possibly can get it in this country. And that's an independent political party that represents the people. I'll just point out that what you're looking at on the screen, if you are watching us live or uh, viewing us on YouTube or Facebook or Rumble uh, after the fact, but for our podcast listeners, the screen is filled with a photo of a much younger Sherry Honkala being arrested. That just shows you, uh, you know, how long she's been at it. Uh, they don't really care about us. And I love this tagline. Poverty is a policy choice. Resistance is necessary. Shimako Noble, I'm going to bring you into this to say, oh, and next, City Snafu allows protests at Democratic Convention's front gate when the whole world is watching. So, how can people get involved, Shamako Noble, into being part of this historic march? That's the first thing is you can always send us money. Um, we love to have your money. Um, no, just, just kidding. It's a joke. No, but no. seriously, um, we are we are raising. No, money you're not. Hey, hold on. Time. That that was a terrible no, 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 pitch. No, no, no. So I'm gonna back up. <laughs> send these people money. Yeah, send us money. No, but we actually do have a lot of really important projects coming up, March included. Um, but are we, are we, Sherry, are we allowed to talk about the center or are we not talking about the center? Can you guys hear her? Because I can't hear I her. Cannot, I, see her I cannot hear Sherry. So. Of course you could talk about the center, but you should also make sure what? you talk about the book, the book. See, but see, that's what I mean. Should we talk about the center? Should we talk about the book? Should we talk about right, the mark? So first of all, let's do this. How are because <laughs> I'm going to take over this unruly crowd. We are going to talk okay. about the all march right. and how people can get involved. Then we're going to talk okay. about the center. Then we're going to talk about okay. the book. In that order. All right, we got 16, we got 16 minutes. Let's make it make it crack. So you, first thing is you can go to Poor People's Army uh, dot org, uh, and there we have a couple of different things. Uh, we have a sponsorship form. Uh, for folks who want to, you know, sponsor the march or for foundations who might want to support our kind of work. It's not really a thing that a lot of mainstream foundations do, but, you know, you have those kind of smaller mom and pops folks that might want to support a group like us. Um, we also have an endorsement form for organizations. Uh, David, I believe you actually are a part of an organization that endorsed, if I am not mistaken. That is correct. Um, the Green Eco Socialist Network are proud endorsers of this march. Absolutely. Uh, and so we are looking for more organizations to endorse. Um, so you can go to poorpeoplesarmy.org, go to the Poor People's March tab and check out endorsements. Um, we're also always looking for volunteers and interns, which I'm going to let Sherry talk more about. Sherry, volunteers and um, interns? Yeah, we take uh, interns from... Sherry's the master of volunteers. <laughs> yeah. We have go interns ahead. from all over the country, all over the world. Um, 
And uh, if people need uh, credit at their universities, come spend some time with us. We'll figure out where you can sleep uh, while you work night and day with us. And it'll be a life-changing experience. Um, and I uh, neglected to say that um, the March on the RNC is July 15th. And the March mm -hmm. on the DNC is August 19th. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the day before the March on the DNC, um, we have tons of amazing artists and musicians uh, that will be perform performing, um, you know, anywhere from like uh, bluegrass to hip hop to country, you name it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I am going to circle back because I, I actually, you know, I, I follow y'all stuff and I did not know about this thing called the center. So I'm going to ask, what is the center? I, I reckon it's in Philadelphia, but uh, that's, that's, that's me just because being smart. Uh, but tell us more about the center. Well, we have a, a group of amazing people um, that have committed to buying us a building and we will have that center uh, that is going to be here in Kensington, where um, it'll be a, a, a cultural hotspot uh, in the country. You can sign up with uh, Shimako now <laughs> to try to get on that stage. Uh, we'll have um, free uh, arts and arts program, uh, music, uh, football, basketball, you name it, for young people, uh, as well as political education. Um, there's a worker component in which um, we're making our own, um, uh, we have our own t-shirt company uh, where we make uh, t-shirts and cups and hats and all of those kinds of things. Um, so if you have a skill or an interest or just want to get involved, uh, we're, we're hoping that people will step forward and um, come to one of our boot camps where we do political education um, or hang out at the center. Okay. And, and so, you know, just to reiterate, folks can join us now or they can join us directly at July 15th or on August 19th at the RNC and the DNC, or they can join us after that. Um, we, have, we have a lot of stuff, um, you know, on the table. So, uh, and if you want to donate, um, I should have mentioned this too, you can go to our website um, and you can go directly to support and our donate um, page, um, as well as a donate button on the bottom of the page. Both of those should take you to a GoFundMe um, we will take your $5 donations. We will take your $10 donations. It, it all helps. We don't take corporate donations. We avoid the, you know, the big foundations, you know, we scrap it up from the bottom up. So, um, we appreciate anything and everything folks can give. So this, I, I'm really intrigued by the, the, the center and it kind of inspired by it because the idea of doing both art and culture and entertainment and political education and uh, grassroots community organizing and skill sharing. Like, you know, to me, this is like, if I can be so bold, that's the transitional program, right? That's the way mm -hmm. to meet our needs in a cooperative society. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to wait till we quote, take the state. That's what I really like about when I hear folks like y'all with the history that uh, poor people's army have is, and that is when, when it, like, because we know when people like us get our hands on property, we share it with each other, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, 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 we house people, we feed people, mm -hmm. we clothe people. And this is the thing that I'm saying is, y'all, we need to actually uh, start, like, there's only three ways to get money that I know of. You beg it, you borrow it, or you steal it. When people like us try to steal money, they kill us or, or, or lock us up. Begging it comes with too many, uh, uh, too, too many of the uh, of the restrictions, right? But what about this? What if we pool our own money together, right? And we're able to put together both grassroots fundraising and those, like I'm gonna just call them class traders, right? 
people who are actually like, I'm just not going to give you money. I'm going to both give you money, but also help you navigate the finance of actually borrowing money. But the borrowing is going to not be like, oh, and now you have an equity stake and you own part of it. It's just like it, for those people uh, fortunate enough to, if you get a mortgage on a house, if you actually pay it off, you get to own it. This is the point that I'm making. I actually see a path now, y'all, where we can put together uh, uh, packages and programs where people like us have community ownership of land to decommodify land for both housing and food production and distribution using agroecology and indigenous food practices and building worker-owned cooperatives and not co-ops just for the sake of co-ops, but co-ops to teach ourselves how to make and produce the things that we need and to use democratic decision making to learn how to be a cooperative people. And then the point is that in integrating both political education and art and culture into all of this, that's how a center can become more than just a building. It can literally become the heartbeat of our movement. It can become the heartbeat of the neighborhood. It can be the heartbeat of revolution. Mm -hmm. Uh, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, that are, are you moving one... to Philly to volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a cheerleader. Yeah. I can be, I can cheerlead right, from afar. Yeah. I'm sorry, Sherry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Well, no, it's just that um, this kind of enters into the other piece that we were going to talk about, which is um, we the have book. A, a book coming out. And um, this book is about our experience with um, being pioneers with housing takeovers and taking land, um, reclaiming land and, and taking over houses. And it's both a how-to, a very specific how-to, uh, as well as um, you know our history for the last 30 years of taking over abandoned houses. And we're doing this at a time in which we're um, training people all over the country how to reclaim housing. Uh, and right now in Philadelphia, you know, we have, you know, over 40 properties of families that are living in uh, abandoned takeover houses. So um, we're sure that this is going to be very interesting, very controversial, a controversial um but we think it's more important to have uh the tools out there in the public and let people um learn how to begin to reclaim their own human rights uh because people are not going to give them to us and uh, we have to figure out how do we take back the basic necessities of life in order to stay alive and i feel like this is what really differentiates us from some of the left um, is we understand that um, our soldiers need to feed, clothe, and house themselves and stay alive in order to be in the forefront of this fight to create a new society. I want to lift up Jackie, who is a frequent listener, viewer, and contributor who uh, writes in to say, poor people can be just as creative and imaginative as the rich because our creativity is based on empathy. And I just really felt like, Shamaka, that's hearkening back to some of the faith-based work and the uh, that you do. And, and even in this conversation, like reminding me not to not to just be a snarky leftist. Well, well you know, it's funny, man, because you know, you're using the term class trainer and I was thinking about it and I was like, Man, that's a crazy way to say just be like a decent human being, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, no, so you know, it's I hope it, uh, I lost it, but um, you know, I I had uh I had pulled up um I, I was studying uh Micah yesterday and I I had pulled up a scripture about basically the violence of the rich and and you know the the dishonesty of the powerful. Nothing it's you know, it's it's nothing new under the sun. And um, you know, I, I think I think all of us in the movement sort of fantasize about, and some of us are lucky enough to have, you know, kind of those like angel investors, right? Those uh, uh, rich people, you know, the, the good ones, right? The, the, the good rich people. Um, 
but no, but I, I mean, I think that's a that's a real thing, though, right? Like, I mean, I think we can all agree, and all of our all of our listeners, watchers, whatever, can agree. Like, the injustice of today is cartoonish. Like, it's ridiculous, and there's no reason. Like, there's no reason for it. Like, there's literally, like, it can only be explained by a lack of immorality and and sickness. You know, I absolutely. Look, I'm glad you actually why, named it. Go ahead, Sha. go. Yeah, absolutely. That's why I get so sick of, uh, you know, this is going to sound terrible, but I get sick of people saying, like, you know, um, like, I've taken an oath to poverty. I, I haven't taken an oath to poverty. I'm rageful. I am rageful that people have to live in such inhumane conditions and I am so thankful that I have been amongst the ranks of the poor because it's always been the poor that have shared the most, um, that have helped me through the hardest times in my life. It hasn't been people that have had money. Um, and I think that that really, that for me, that really says volumes. And this is, you know, I just can't, I, I just can't see people living in these inhumane conditions anymore. It's it, it, look. There's a couple of things here. One, the data is clear that uh, poor folk and working class folk give much higher percentages uh, of their money away. They have less of it, but they give far greater percentages of it away. Poor folks share better than rich folks. That's number one. Number two, that I really want to uh, lift up and and circle back to Shamako's point, y'all, and that is this level of wealth inequality. Like these folks at the top, they're hoarding not only money, but wealth and power. It's sick. Yo, like they yo, yo, yo. We would we would consider it absolutely insanity if it were any other thing. That's what I'm saying. If, like, any, if, dude. if you if you if you if you had one billion dollars worth of sweatshirts just like sitting around in your house. And like still trying to get like, more. And still trying to get no, like literally stealing sweatshirts from other people. Like you're like, like you know what I mean? Like Look here, they're like on TV giving. right now. There's like reality you're, you're still, shows. You're There's stealing reality the sweatshirts shows. People, you're stealing the sweatshirts that people like save their whole life for. You know what I mean? That their grandmothers gave them. You know, it's just it's insane. It's no, insane. Look here. It is insane. And there are literally TV shows right now where interventions are staged with hoarders, right? To say, oh, yeah. you have a problem. We love you. Like, like this is actually. But you're, like, but you're a mogul if you do it with money. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, yeah, you know, like, oh, let's look, like put them on TV, like, you know, and, and, and worship these people. We like, we, yeah, we need to do rich people interventions. We do. Uh, like, look at here. Let me tell you something. If we wealth. had, if we had a just and compassionate society, we would get these people the mental health that help that they so obviously need. But because, like, you know, if we had single payer health care, like we would literally, they, there would be like they, they are actually sick and damaged. But the problem is they not just hurting themselves. They're literally destroying the planet. They are literally forcing people to live in inhumane, grotesque, mm -hmm. horrific, sadistic uh, ways. And there's no reason for it. There is more wealth and more power. And get this, the uh, if we democratized the economy and the robotics and the technology, it, like what is now available now, there's more than enough to go around. Like there's so much, so much. All we have to do is organize and take it. And I'm going to actually say it that way, y'all. We're going to have to organize and take power because one of the greatest American philosophers of all time said it well. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. And my, many people don't know the second part of that. And it goes like this. Frederick <laughs> Douglass <laughs> said, oh, you yeah. show me the exact amount of injustice that any people are willing to tolerate, and I will show you the exact amount of injustice that will be visited upon them. And that's what's okay. happening. This grotesque thing is happening because we're allowing it. Absolutely, the predatory class and the, the horrific robber barons are to blame. But you know what? They're not going to solve it. 
The only way it gets solved is if we organize, unite, and fight. Sorry, I'll get again. Like I, yeah, Sherry <laughs> Huckle and uh, Shimako Noble remind me of, of my, uh, you know, my my grandfather, the Baptist preacher. I get to I get to preaching, right? Yeah, yeah. I can't help it. Yeah, yeah, word. So look at here. This has been a fantastic time. The hour has flown by. I do want to give both of y'all a chance for final words. Remember, folks, you've been watching and or listening to Redneck Gone Green. We are talking to Sherry Honkala and Shamako Noble, uh, two leaders of the Poor People's Army. Shamako, let's kick it off to you. Yeah, I'll just keep it simple. www.poorpeoplesarmy.org. Again, that is www.poorpeoplesarmy.org. Uh, come check out our blog. We're, you know, very interested in having writers. Uh, check out our education section. There's programs we can bring to you. Um, check out, check out the march. You know, and um, keep, you know, keep, keep, keep the struggle alive, folks. Keep the struggle alive. Go ahead, Sherry. Mm -hmm. And bring us to your town. Uh, you know, there's many of us. Uh, start a poor people's army. Uh, uh, group in your part of the country and um, you know give us a call that's all you need to do and we'll help you start one if you're homeless out there learn how to take a house you don't have to be homeless get organized that's what you need at the end of the day the most important thing that we have is each other and uh, let's take this thing back Right on. And folks, that was Sherry Honkala and Shimako Noble of the Poor People's Army. I want to give a, a thank you to Jack Rabbit, our a producer here at Redneck Gone Green. I want to thank you, the listener viewer. Uh, remember that this audience is growing. We're getting larger, stronger, better organized every day because of you. Please go subscribe to us on Substack for our weekly writings. Uh, continue to share the YouTube, the Facebook, the Rumble, like uh, the Carrier Pigeons, all the things. And join us next week when we'll be talking to Reverend Billy of the Church of Stop Shopping. Peace, y'all. <laughs>